I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we're about halfway through our legislative session, and I'm really proud of my colleagues uh, for everything they've put forth so far this year to accomplish our, our agendas that we outlined earlier. I just want to highlight the fact that to date we passed uh, some, some good crime measures to, to help hold people accountable and keep Missourians safe. Uh, we passed a, uh, some good education reform with open enrollment, passed some property tax measures with some other property tax measures yet on the calendar. An energy stability bill is on the calendar, ready to go. IP reform will get done. The Senate did it. It's coming over here. We have that ready to go. And uh, very importantly, we've also passed a, a very good pro-life bill. So I couldn't be more proud of my colleagues um, and the work that they've done in the committee process. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of bills yet to do and a lot of work yet to get done. But one of the most important things, as you well know, that we have to do is pass a budget. And I could not be more proud of our, our budget committee, who has put forth a substantial investment in Missouri while keeping Missouri uh, fiscally responsible and putting forth a balanced budget. And with that said, I'd like to turn the microphone over to the gentleman from Jasper, our budget chair, Cody Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, we will be unveiling the initial version of the House budget, and uh, this goes back to the story of how, how we got to, to today. It goes back to December when the Missouri House started to meet uh, to have a, a series of hearings on, on the department requests and, and uh, getting through to today. We've been through probably thousands of hours in work uh, to, to create this version of the House budget. Uh, when the governor made his recommendation, recommendations earlier this year, we found ultimately that he proposed that we use the surplus in part to support ongoing revenues and require the, or essentially balance the budget that way. Uh, the Missouri House budget brings those, that ongoing spending back within the range of the revenue estimate. And we are prioritizing balancing that budget with our ongoing revenues and uh, with an eye on sustainability going towards the future. Uh, this budget also prioritizes public safety, transportation infrastructure, and public education. On public education, the foundation formula is fully funded. The transportation formula is fully funded. We have a series of investments, partnerships with our higher education institutions across the state. On public safety, we have uh, Supporting, we're supporting law enforcement across the state. Uh, our highway patrol and, and local uh, political subdivisions and their law enforcement agencies with a, an emphasis on the St. Louis region. Partnering with uh, law enforcement agencies in that region to try to help control the crime issues that they've had there. Uh, additionally, we provide additional resources to continue our mission in Texas with the Missouri National Guard to secure, uh, secure the United States southern border. And on public transportation, we have a variety of uh, infrastructure projects from across the state. Uh, we saw the Missouri House last year put in a variety of unfunded highway projects. Those are all back in the House's version of the budget this year. In addition to that, we have appropriated a little over $700 million to rebuild I-44. And that includes a, a variety of projects from the Joplin area to six lanes all the way through Springfield and over to Rolla. Uh, and these are these are, this is a generational investment uh, to rebuild one of the main arteries across our state. And so again, you see the, the Missouri House version of the budget prioritizing those three, those three things, public safety, transportation infrastructure, and public education. Uh, we additionally support life within this budget. We have additional resources for pregnancy resource centers, and we are providing provider rate increases for those that take care of the most vulnerable in our state. Uh, developmental disability support providers and nursing home providers will see a rate increase with the uh, house version of the budget. So uh, we've done this while getting the, getting the budget to balance within our revenue estimates and keeping a considerable amount of money on the bottom line for future rainy days. Uh, so the, the top line number for ongoing uh, operating budget is a little under $49 billion. I'm sorry, it's a little under $50 billion. It's about 49 nine and our ending balance is about $1.83 billion, billion dollars in GR as compared to the governor's version, which was about $52 billion in ongoing with a, a, a bottom line number of about $1.5 billion. So that's a very quick overview of where we're at. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. So what are the key things that we have cut from this budget? Um, the pay raise plan was 3.2% plus a, 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 a seniority. Um, aspect of it. There's in, in 
the new, newer new money for higher education? Where have we made the cuts in general? So the pay plan is intact. We have the pay plan as recommended, 3.2% for state workers. Uh, there, the, the conversation about tenure pay within the pay plan, uh, what I would also, what I would probably describe as a specialized pay plan for certain segments of state government, I think we, we need to continue to look at that. We've heard some uh, concern within state government, uh, the workforce within state government about uh, the fairness of the pay, pay, pay plan as proposed. We'll continue to work on that. Higher education, we have reduced back a little bit the core increases that the governor proposed. We've made those one-time increases at 2%. He proposed 3%. Uh, we've dialed that back to 2% and made that one time. There's a couple reasons for that. Obviously, the sustainability piece, we need to be able to make sure that we can pay for that again <coughs> next year. With one-time increases, we can come back like next year, look at it, and decide if we, if we can uh, continue to provide those increases. Uh, and the other thing is the, the performance pay that we've talked about within higher education over the last many years. We haven't made any progress with that. I've been here, this is my eighth year, and my first year here we were talking about performance pay at public, uh, public higher education institutions, and we're still kind of where we started some eight years ago. So by one timing those increases, I think we, we kind of force a continuation of that conversation around performance pay. I'm of the opinion that if we're going to increase core funding for higher education, we should do it through a performance pay model rather than kind of continuing this uh, patchwork quilt uh, way that we, we have core appropriations for higher education. So more broadly than that, Rudy, we have uh, reduced lapse authority across the budget. We've looked very closely at actual expenditures as compared to appropriation and looked at utilization across the budget and made reductions correspondingly. Uh, we've also just said no to some recommended increases for programs that I feel that I think we feel are collectively less of a priority uh, as opposed to things like nursing home provider rates, state pay plan, those types of things. So uh, you'll see that we, we did not uh, fund all of the new decision items in the recommendations, but broadly we feel like we covered all the bases that we need to. What is the example uh, of the record, you said no to recommended increases for programs that are lower priority. Can you make <coughs> so, so there are a variety of things. In the foundation formula, we are able to, uh, where the governor recommended a GR increase for that, we are using, using lottery proceeds to pay for that. So, so we are using a different fund type there uh, to pay for the foundation formula. Uh, different things like software programs that, that the state government has requested, we are asking them to look within their core budgets to find those dollars to pay for, uh, you know, just kind of basic functional software programs. Uh, and just a lot of little little things trimming up here and there that really added up over the course or over the span of a $52 billion budget. Uh, so there's there's no one great big thing that, that comes to mind, uh, but it's a variety of small choices that we've made to, to try to trim up the package. Where does child care funding fall in this? So we have funded child care funding and we are going to the 100% for toddlers and uh, I'm sorry, 100% for infants and 65% for the rest of the children. Uh, we have found after looking at that more closely that we believe we can appropriate quite a bit less to fully fund that item. Uh, we've had less utilization in the state uh, than we expected to have and DESE and the, DESE had requested 100% utilization for the child care subsidy rate. Uh, the governor recommended the same. Uh, our utilization we have found is more about 75% and so we've actually left a little bit of room there for growth and utilization and trimmed away the rest. We're also leveraging federal funds for that where we are using the child care subsidy federal money that we have, the discretionary piece, uh, and directing the department to plug that into the rate for another year. So it's, it's a lesser number uh, to begin with but we're also using federal funds while we have them to pay for child care subsidy rate increases. I want to ask about the $40 million for teacher pay. Mm -hmm. Is that through the um, grant, the teacher baseline salary grant, or is to that actually change state statute from $25,000 to $40,000? It doesn't change state statute, but it does provide the funding to go to $40,000 for the teachers. And so, um, yeah, so that's, it's, I think the recommendation is, is uh, it's, it's parallel to the governor's recommendation. I do think Again, we have lesser utilization, just like childcare across the state. We don't have as many districts.
taking advantage of that program. So we think our actual expenses there will be less than what the governor's recommendation or the department request were. But we feel like we will provide the resources to the districts that seek to utilize that program and take those teachers to 40000 a year if they choose to. The what about it asked for $2.3 So the, the 2.3 million was a, a, uh, a supplemental request within this current fiscal year. So that would get us through the end of the fiscal year. So we took that and multiplied it to get us through a, an entire next fiscal year uh, going into the next year. So it's essentially four times what the governor had recommended or requested for this supplemental in the current fiscal year, if that makes sense. This is his recommendation or his request for that supplemental was to get us through FY24. We are essentially continuing that cost into FY25, and that's that's the total there. I have I've spoke to Senator Lincoln Huff, who said that he's starting to talk about stripping out four billion dollars from the budget in order to take care of the FRA because he's not sure what's going to happen. Is that thought also in the back of your mind, finding four billion dollars to make up for the FRA if it's not done? It's really not. I, I think that the FRA ultimately will get done. Uh, you know, the conversation about uh, including the, the Planned Parenthood language in the FRA still lingers, and we have sent them a bill. I have a House Bill 2634 that, that will resolve that. We just had that in their Senate, uh, a Senate committee that was voted out yesterday. I think they could take up that bill, kind of alleviate that issue, ask the governor to sign it right away, and then they should be able to move forward with the FRA without a lot of uh, contention there. But all of the disagreement around that is within that chamber. And so as soon as they are able to clear up whatever issues they have around the FRA, my hope is that they could pass it out. As long as we take care of this Planned Parenthood issue in the process, I think the House would be agreeable to taking up and passing the FRA. I really don't worry too much about it. I think that ultimately gets resolved. Last year, there were complaints that by the time the budget came back to the House, there wasn't enough time to really evaluate the changes that the Senate made, as well as conference bills. Are you concerned about timeline coming in the second half? It, that's always a concern. I, this is my sixth year as the chair, and, and each year we wish we had a little more time to see the Senate version of the budget. Uh, this year, I think, you know, we will be communicating, them, communicating to them early and often that we need to take the time to, to fully understand everything. We can't have a repeated process that we've had for the last couple of years where we see that, you know, particularly the, the federal, federal bill, House Bill 20, come across the rotunda at the last minute and, and, and uh, not really have enough time to fully vet it. And so I think that, that we won't take that tack this year. We will make sure that we allow ourselves enough time to, to take a good look at it. But you tried to start like a month early in December and that obviously didn't pan out to, you know, that didn't result in having any effect on getting getting things done. I, I disagree that it didn't have any effect. I think that we've, you know, we, we, it's, we have a approximately $50 billion budget. Uh, we don't want to rush through the process. We want to be thoughtful about how we craft the budget. And so I feel good about the time that we've taken, the amount of hours that we've invested in this, and I feel really good about the, end, the finished product. And so, all the time we spent on this is not time wasted, and it's certainly, we're getting this done. Today you'll see the unveiling of the, the primary house plan. We'll, we'll make some small changes here and there, you know, likely over the course of the next several weeks, uh, and then get them the, the last version. But as of today, we'll have tracking documents and legislation made public that gives the Senate and everyone else 95% of probably what the final product will be. And so they have had all of this time to understand the governor's budget to work on their but work on their version as well. And I think they'll have plenty of time to, to digest exactly what the House proposes. And, um, you know, I wish I would have another second half of session to see what the Senate might have in mind. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So I don't think we're late. I think we're right on time and feel good about the, the finished product. I want to ask the impact of um, the Medicaid eligibility renewal process on the budget. And are you making any uh, accommodations for people who maybe have <coughs> several months of medical needs that have to be covered when they do get their finally get renewed if they've just been if it's just been a paperwork issue or something? Well, so redeterminations have had a an impact on the cost or the appropriations that we're we're making for Medicaid. 
uh, with the public health emergency and our inability to remove anyone from the rolls, our Medicaid rolls became, like every other state, inflated with folks that didn't necessarily qualify. Maybe they moved out of state, maybe there's been a change, uh, but we, we continue to pay for Medicaid or appropriate for Medicaid for them. Redeterminations, logically and rightfully so, have started to reduce the overall size and cost of Medicaid. Uh, so if there are inevitably any government program that provides a service like Medicaid, you'll have some snafus where people are, are removed that maybe shouldn't be and struggle to get back on and have to deal with uh, the bureaucratic process to do that. We will, uh, you know, if folks are eligible for Medicaid in Missouri, we are ultimately going to appropriate for that and uh, I don't see that changing in, in the near term, and this budget certainly does that. But, uh, but you know, bottom line, redeterminations have had a positive effect, in my opinion, on the size being lesser uh, in the cost of our Medicaid program. How much of the 2.8 billion below the government would you attribute to perhaps a lower amount of Medicaid money? Yeah, it's significant. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, we do have the advantage of, of having a little more clarity around redetermination, and we're probably more aggressive about how we, uh, how we appropriate for that and what we think may happen between now and the end of the fiscal year. I want to ask about I-44, because when I talked to the governor after his state of the state, he said that he talked about how the money that was in the budget would go towards environmental studies, getting prepared, getting ready to start I-44. This in here says for the rebuilding, including six lanes, is this actually start shovel in the ground, or is this the environmental study still? It is, uh, so there, it's both, actually. There's, there are a few pieces specifically around Springfield uh, and into Joplin, the I-49 and 44 interchange, where MoDOT feels comfortable enough to go ahead and start with these projects. And so when they say environmental study, they're, they're talking about the impact of uh, the landscape, how the hills and the turns and things affect the cost and things like that. I always thought of it as, you, you know, we can't build on, uh, a t you know, a top of a, a historic site or we can't, uh, you know, we might disrupt nature in some way if we, you know, you think of environmental study. But actually it's more of a topographical understanding of, of the, the changes required in the projects and, and thereby affecting the cost. Bottom line, MoDOT understands uh, I-44 through Springfield well enough to go ahead and get started. They understand that the I-70, I uh, I'm sorry, I-49, uh, I-44 interchange is ready to be begin. So those two things are, are shovel ready. The RALA piece, uh, which is the third bucket here that we're appropriating for on I-44, is going to have to have uh, the environmental study finished, I think, before they really get done through that. So, uh, so they'll be, be able to be, be able to get, begin in southwest Missouri on 44, and then as they work their way northeast, uh, hopefully by the time the environmental study is done, they'll be able to do that as well. I have a non-budget question. Um, so this would be either for Representative McGall or the speaker. Okay. Um, Thank uh, you. Senator Mary Elizabeth Coleman basically asked the Elections Committee to put on measures on the IP bill that was not related, well, that's basically additional than raising the threshold to make it harder than the Constitution. Is that the House plan to go through with that? Thoughts on that topic? Please. You know, I will uh, defer to, to the representative that manages our uh, elections committee. I, I thought the committee's done a great job having hearings on IP reform. I believe the House has a good IP bill as well. Um, but I'm going to defer uh, to Representative Mogal on, on the comments on what the committee heard as I uh, was not attentively paying as much attention as I'm sure she was. Oh, yes, I pay attention. However, I don't know that I would have a definitive answer for you today, and I apologize for that, because after yesterday in the Senate, I think they made it clear that they don't like the plan that we were working toward. So I think there's going to be a lot of uh, give and take there, and we do have not only um, the Senate joint resolution, we have the House joint resolution that included three on the bill string, so we've got a good product. I just don't know what, what exactly we'll end up with, but thank you for the question. Uh, Representative Bakker, can I ask you about the FRA, because we haven't seen any action on the other side of the building yet. We're halfway through, and it's something that pretty much has to be done. So It does, and you know, I mean, I think I, I, I relate back to last time when I was the floor leader. We passed the FRA a lot. Um, we put it on a lot of different bills. We passed it clean. Um, I don't want to speak for the Democrats behind you, but I believe it's a bipartisan belief that we pass, we need to pass it clean. I believe the House will stand firm 
and, and pass a good FRA. Again, you know, 100 yards away, what they do over there. Does that mean that you guys are still going to wait for them to take it up first before you guys I mean, do? at this point, we are. I mean, we're like, you know, I think the, the challenge is for them to get across the line. I, I don't you know, speak for, for Cody or, or the other side of the aisle, but I mean, I believe we can pass a clean FRA. We've done everything we can to protect life that we value. Uh, we, we certainly believe in protecting the life that the FRA protects as well, and we look forward to passing a good FRA component. Um, the fact that you referenced a moment ago that the uh, senator over there was already anticipating a $4 billion shortfall uh, would, would allude to doom and gloom, but uh, I don't live in this building with doom and gloom. I'm an eternal optimist. I believe we get it done. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. Are, are there any concerns about maybe having to go to a special session like the last time it was up? It, it won't be. It won't be due to the House's actions, I believe. Uh, if I'm a, a gaming man, which is another bill we, you know, might be able to get across the line. <laughs> um, Y'all perfected House Bill uh, 1777 uh, that deals with uh, restraints on children, uh, restraints on pregnant uh, women. I don't know if one of the co-sponsors of that, but I wanted to uh, ask about that bill and the, the importance if of it. One of the sponsors, co-sponsors of the bill is here. There's a handful of them, I don't know. Or yeah, there are, you know, I mean, we're always looking to protect children, really, uh, families uh, and, and citizens in Missouri uh, to protect their rights, um, take care of them health-wise, education-wise, um, and I think that leans into that realm. That, that was a bipartisan bill, and there's been several of those where, where you've seen co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle. Is that important? How I don't know. Can you speak to the number of bills that have? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not our agenda to, to just to, to count the number of times we get along. I mean, I think our agenda is to try to find common ground where we can, and even when we disagree, to, to try to work together. And I think that we've demonstrated that year in and year out. This year, maybe seemingly. A little bit better, I hope. But you know, we just do our best, right? And I think the other side of the aisle finds us frustrating sometimes, as we find them frustrating. Um, but we'll continue to work together, and where we can com find common ground, we'll build on that. I have to ask about question. after speaking with the ethics committee this week. Have you gotten any indication of when that will wrap up, and do you have any comment on those? proceedings and how they're affecting oh I would love group. the comment I have a whole lot to say but no you know what the answer to your question is not soon enough can I ask right? about the bills thank the you. difference in the we're bills. good I think but thank you guys so much we look forward to getting started when we come back next Monday